Hey everybody, this video is called Jeroboam's Least Favorite Prophet. And tonight we're going to continue our pass-through study here in the book of 1 Kings, looking at the 13th chapter, where we're going to look at Jeroboam's message through the prophet. So 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 1 and 2 says, And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burned on you. So Josiah would rule Judah approximately 300 years later, between the years of uh, 640 to 609 BC, as we're going to see in our next book study, Lord Willen, in Second Kings chapter 22 and 23. And the prophet predicted that Josiah would slaughter the illegitimate priests of the high places of his day who made offerings on the altar uh, at Bethel. And this prophecy was realized in Second Kings 23 verse 15 through 20 and ex executing the divine judgment on the non-Levitical priesthood established by Jeroboam that we looked at in the last chapter verses 31 and 32. And Jeroboam, he went to the grave worried about the fulfillment of this prophecy because this prophecy did not come immediately on Jeroboam. In verse 3 through 5 it says, And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, who cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him! Then his hand, which he stretched out toward him, withered so that he could not pull it back to himself the altar also was split apart and the ashes poured out it from the altar according to the sign which the man of god had given by the word of the lord and so verses three through five the sign was an immediate wonder that served to authenticate the reliability of the long-term prediction and we see it came to pass in verse 5 and the proper ritual required the disposal of the sacrificial ashes in the special clean place for the ashes as seen back in Leviticus chapter 4 verse 12 and Leviticus chapter 6 verse 10 and 11 in contact with the groundwork render the ashes unclean and void the procedure and the sign was a direct rebuke to the idolatrous worship that was at that altar and instead of responding to the message of the messenger we see that Jeroboam's reaction was immediately to shut up the messenger he wanted to silence the messenger by having him taken into custody arrested and God confirmed his word of judgment in two ways first he judged the disobedient king at a precise point in his most glaring sin. And then the second part was he fulfilled the immediate word against the altar. In verse 6 says, Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me, that my hand may be restored, uh, restored to me, so that the man of God entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him, and became as before so under the evident judgment of god here jeroboam had no use for the golden calves of or their altars and he knew that the only hope that he could have was in the lord and his representative and as you'll see in the upcoming chapters he's not really repentant here and wanting to receive something from god is not the same thing as repentance and the man of God, he showed great grace to Jeroboam. And he moved him from being under arrest to an intercessor of his persecutor. 
in verse 7 through 10, it says, Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. But the man of God said to the king, If you were to give me half your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread or nor drink water in this place. For it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You should not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. So Jeroboam, he quickly and naturally, given the circumstances, embraced the man of God as a friend. And he wanted to refresh and reward him and without any repentance from the sin that the man of God had denounced. And the man of God refused the invitation based on a prior warning from the Lord. And to accept Jeroboam's invitation would be to as in to partake with his idolatry and fellowship. In verse 11 through 17 says, Now an old prophet dwelt in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. And their father said to them, Which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went and who came from Judah. Then he said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it, and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Then he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I cannot return nor I cannot return with you nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For I have been told by the word of the Lord, you should not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. So we see here was a spokesperson of the Lord who had compromised his ministry by his willingness to live at the very center of this false system of worship without speaking out against it. He was living in compromise. And this prophet of Bethel invited the unnamed man of God to his home as Jeroboam had invited him. And the man of God refused for the same reason that he refused Jeroboam. He was not going to be wrapped up in this ungodliness. And I want to look at verse 10 again. It says, So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to Bethel. So, uh, to continue on, it says, verse 18, 19, He said to him, I am too a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. He was lying to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. So, why the old prophet deceived the man of God, the text does not state. But it may be that his own sons were worshippers at Bethel, or perhaps the priests and this man wanted to gain favor with the king by showing up the man of God as an imposter who would act contrary to the claim to have heard from God. And accustomed to receive in direct revelations, the Judean prophet here should have regarded the supposed angelic message with suspicion and sought divine verification of this revised order. And in our wrap-up, we're going to talk about how Satan can masquerade as an angel of light. In uh, verse uh, 20 through 22, says, Now it happened as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God has commanded you. But you came back and ate bread and drank water in the place which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread or drink water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. 
So verse 20 through 22, the lie arose from his own imagination, but the true prophecy came from the Lord. Just like many people today that claim that they have a word from the Lord outside of the recorded word of God, it comes out of their own imagination. I hate to be a spoiler alert here, but the Israelites, they buried their dead with the bones of ancestors in a common grave, as we saw back in the book of Judges chapter 8 verse 32 and 2 Samuel chapter 2 verse 32. And the lack of such a burial was considered in Israel a severe punishment and disgrace. And God promised great judgment against the man of God from Judah for his disobedience. And this was a hard test, and the man of God from Judah failed it. And he should have kept the commandment from the Lord. And we see that God judges the man of God from Judah more strictly than he had judged Jeroboam or the prophet from Bethel. And in our wrap-up, we'll talk about a little bit further into that, how God judges his own first. Uh, verse 23-24 says, So it was after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he had saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown on the road. And the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse. So the second prophet from Bethel was fulfilled. And he did not say that the man of God would perish by a lion, but that he would not be buried in the tomb of his fathers. And both the lion and the donkey, we see that they acted unnaturally. Typically, that lion is going to have a nice second lunch at that point. And the donkey did not run, and the lion did not attack the donkey or disturb the man's body. And unlike the disobedient prophet, the beast, they bent their will to the sovereignty of God. Even creation will, will you know, submit to God's sovereignty, such as the animals. And... Uh, verse 24, uh, you know, I, I think of it as getting attacked by a lion. It, it just gives me, you know, the shrivers to even think about it. But the lion, the, this lion was on a special mission from God, and it seems to be more obedient than the man of God from Judah was. And just think about that. I mean, I think of uh, back in the book of Numbers with the donkey and uh, the uh, guy, I can't think of his name off the top of my head at this point in time. But uh, verse 25 through 32 says, And there men passed by and saw the corpse thrown on the road, and the lion standing by the corpse. And they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now when the prophet had brought him back from the way he heard it, from the way he heard it, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord had delivered him to the lion which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke to him. And he spoke to his son, saying, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. Then he went out and found his corpse thrown on the road, and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse nor torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, and brought it back. So the old prophet came to the city to mourn, to bury him. Then he laid the corpse in his own, his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother, so it was after he had burned him that he spoke to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in my tomb where the man of God is buried." Lay my bones beside his bones, for the sayings which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel, and against all the shrines in, on the high places, which are the cities of Samaria, will surely come to pass. And so this old prophet from Bethel was sympathetic to the man of God from Judah, even in his disobedience and resulting in judgment. And it had to be strange for the old prophet to look 
upon the carcass of the dead prophet and realized that his sin was worse than his, yet he did not meet the same fate as the other. And it had to be confusing in God's ways of judgment. And, you know, God's judgment, we can never fully grasp, you know, why God judges so-and-so differently than so-and-so here. And, you know, why does God show mercy to some and not to others? In uh, verse 33 through 34, to wrap up the chapter here, says, After this, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but again he made priests from every class of people for the high places. Whoever wished, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. So unlike the old prophet, Jeroboam did not change his evil ways, and he continued appointing priests outside of the tribe of Levi to serve at these high places. And in ancient Israel, God commanded a strict separation between the office of king and prophet. And Jeroboam had no cares in the world. And Jeroboam did not obey the Lord's commands, nor did he ever fulfill his potential or promise. And we're going to see next week who's noted in chapter 16 that is worse than Jeroboam. We can look at this text and be like, Jeroboam was a pretty bad guy. But for now, we'll keep you hanging, wondering as we go into the video and at the end, Jeroboam is an example of our sinful failure. And so to wrap up our study today, we looked at the coming destruction of the altar in Bethel. And we looked at signs used to confirm the prophet's words. And we saw Jeroboam's plea. We saw that the man of God had, declared, had declined Jeroboam's invitation. And we see that the old prophet... And Bethel invited the man of God to dinner. And we saw that the prophet from Bethel lied to the man of God from Judah. So we see a pretty crazy, almost you could probably think of it as almost like a soap opera. Very dramatic here. But uh, if an angel did really speak to him, it was a deceiving angel. As we know that cults have start, that have been started by deceiving angels and you know the first one i can think of right off the top of my head of a deceiving angel is mormonism you know mormonism's only a couple hundred years old and joseph smith he claimed that he had visits from an angel named moroni hopefully i said that right but uh, i want to check out second corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 through 15 and what you got to ask is if you were to have a unnatural experience, you know, with something that claims to be an angel, would you believe that angel was sent by God? Would you believe anything that angel was to tell you? And I want to look here, 2 Corinthians 11. And we'll be looking at verses, uh, we'll start with verse 12 through 15. It says, but what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be, dis to be regarded just as we are in the things which we boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms, you know, Satan himself transforms, Satan himself changes himself into an angel of light therefore there is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works and so i believe that satan and his angels can appear as angels of light and the apostle paul in galatians 1 8 9 stated that even if an angel from heaven was to preach a different gospel than the one that you've been taught, let them be accursed. And, you know, I believe with these scriptures, 
that demons can impersonate an angel and start cults and all different false movements. And we saw the prophet from Bethel prophesied the doom of the man of God. And we may think strict judgment should begin among the ungodly. That is often how we think. We think that, you know, because we are, you know, in Christ, that we are no longer under judgment. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, I want to look at the verse over here. verse 17 it says for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of god and if it begins with us first what will the end of those who do not obey the gospel of god and first peter 4 17 the judgment of god begins at the house of god but wait we are not under condemnation for those who are in christ we know that from romans chapter 8 verse 1 so is this a contradiction in the word of God or is judgment more than just God, you know, judging, um, you know, for us believers, his church, the judgment is in the form of chastisement. In Hebrews chapter 12, we see that the Lord chastises us as, you know, children, you know, parents, if they parent correctly, they're going to have to have corrective action and you know they're going to have to punish their children to you know bring them back to line and you know that's what god does with us too and you know all i can think of is oh how much worse will god's judgment be among the ungodly if he starts his judgment first on his people and you know thank the lord when we are in christ we are no longer condemned we are justified we are declared righteous through the works of christ but those that are outside of christ they're up to the full judgment they're up to you know hell and damnation and we saw the word of the prophet from bethel is fulfilled and we saw that the man of god is given a decent bureau and the prophet from bethel testified to his prophecy and we see at the end that jeroboam had no repentance and we ought to note that we are not called because of obedience and our disobedience hinders our potential full use and i want to look at second timothy chapter 2 verse 21 says therefore if anyone cleanses himself from the latter he will be a vessel for honor sanctified and useful for the master prepared for every good work and god god uses vessels of honor separation and usefulness and preparation to their fullest potential and you know you know we obey god because we love god and you know, if we love God, we're going to want to serve God and we're going to want to be a vessel of honor. And that's going to wrap up today's video. We'll see in next as we'll be looking at the end of Jeroboam and the end of Rehoboam. So I hope you have a great rest of your evening. God bless and we'll see you in our next study.